The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Nyer, and I'm with the Virginia SBDC. For those of you who are not familiar, the Virginia SBDC is the largest and most effective provider of customized counseling and education for small businesses in Virginia. Most of our services are offered locally in 27 th locations throughout the Commonwealth. Today's webinar is one of our educational offerings and is part of our ongoing webinar series, Google and Beyond, Marketing and Managing on the Web. Today's topic is Big Fish and a Small Marketing Pond. All of our webinars are presented by Ray Sidney Smith, a digital business strategist, Google Small Business Advisor, Evernote Certified Consultant, and Hootsuite Google Brand Advisor, and of course, President of W3 Consulting. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those into the question window, and Ray will do his best to answer them. Without further ado, here's Ray Sidney Smith. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the Virginia SBDC for having me here on the webinar series. As Tracy said, today we're going to be talking about marketing your small business on, quote unquote, the other social networks, and just a couple of housekeeping items. Let's see what's going on. There we go. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask those now. This, this is the time to you know, pop your questions into the question panel, let Tracy know. She will interject and I'll, and I'll be happy to answer those questions as we make our way through. We have a lot of material to cover today, so I'm going to be speaking pretty quickly, uh, but by all means, um, feel free to say, hey, Ray, you know, I didn't understand that. Uh, also, if you have any questions that show up after the webinar, say that you're watching the archived version of this and you have a question, feel free to go ahead and tweet at me. I'm always available by Twitter and uh, hashtag that. I'll know what the context is, uh, but also I'll have my email address on the final slide. So if you do need to email, you can go ahead and do that. I'll be happy to try to give you an answer and, and a resource uh, that will help. And then, of course, we want to follow at Virginia SBDC. That's where they put out notices of the upcoming webinars, but also other information and programs that the Small Business Development Center, Center Network is doing um, on your behalf out there in the Commonwealth. So let's get started on our agenda for today, which is, one, why would you want to uh, go small? We have the the major social networks out there in the world, Facebook, Instagram, uh, you know, uh, YouTube, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, why would we want a small social network as our, our place to foster and grow our community as opposed to the larger ones? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then I will spend the bulk majority of our time together uh, doing a survey of all the small social networks I think are useful to you as a small business owner. And then I'll talk briefly at the end about choosing the right social network. What are some of the litmus, what is the litmus test or the litmus tests that you might give uh, to deciding on which social network to choose if our survey uh, together doesn't necessarily answer that question. And then I'll leave a little bit of time there at the end for Q&A. Uh, Tracy will close out and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, thereafter. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, why, why go small? Uh, the, the answer, to that question is really a matter of business interest. Uh, in, in general, we want to think about this from the perspective of if you are in a small social network, your chance of being able to, you know, quote unquote, dominate your market, that is, be a larger presence in your market, hence the big fish, small pond analogy or metaphor. And the idea here is that if you are on Facebook, there are a billion people on Facebook. And if you are on Twitter, there are hundreds of millions of people on there. All of them are not your friend. Uh, all of them are not your followers. And to a great extent, a lot of it is automated chatter. And, and chatter is actually a technical term. And that is the is kind of the garbage dialogue that happens out there in the world, along with you know automated machine generated uh, content. And so because of all of that chatter, uh, it really creates less value for larger social networks, and they do a great deal of, of work to be able to limit that. I mean, they've, doing, they've been doing a lot of hard work, hard internal, looking internally in the systems, but also looking externally at what people are doing and trying to, uh, to adapt and be flexible to that situation. But it's just a reality that the smaller the network, the more control they have over certain things, and really the less oversight that they have from, say, federal regulatory bodies and uh, and other types of, of um, kind of eyes on them, that they're given a little bit more latitude in the way in which they can operate. And that sometimes actually means that businesses can operate a little bit more flexibly and adaptively in that environment as well. So I think that this is a great, just, just, just 
sheer numbers, you have a greater chance of being a larger influencer for the target audience on those platforms than you do if you go to Facebook. So that's just, you know, six of one half dozen of the other, I suppose, you know, large audience, like on Facebook, you get a lot, a lot of people that you could potentially get in front of, but I'd rather you get in front of the right people. And that leads me to my next point, which is that most of you are local businesses. And so if I looked at all of your accounting books, which I see a lot of accounting records and reports from a lot of, of small businesses, most of your revenues actually are generated from, from very local sources, which means that if I take any one of your businesses, uh, the vast majority of you, probably 80 or 90% of you, if I plopped a, a pin on, on Google Maps and drew a five mile radius, most of your revenues come from that five mile radius. So just draw a circle around yourself and that's where your money's coming from. So why would you not want to go to a social network where it was explicitly designed for that local community? And that's really what I'm talking about here is uh, not only managing a smaller community where you have higher influence as my first point, but second, a smaller community means smaller geographic space where you can actually reach out and, and touch your community, right? You can actually shake hands with them, hug them, look them, look them in the eyes, and that creates a stronger bond and a stronger community generally. And finally, I get this argument all the time, and so I wanna nip it in the bud, not for the, you know, this won't be the last time I'm asked it, but it'll be, it's certainly the next time, which is when, when a business comes to me and says, okay, Ray, I want to have a national or international business, and I say, as I always do, how do you eat an elephant? You eat it bite by bite. And the reality is, is that if you think that you are going to put up your website, your business website, you're gonna launch your startup and you're gonna jump onto social media and tomorrow you're gonna to be a superstar, it's a possibility, but it's not likely, okay? So the reality is, is that if you wanna dominate in a particular vertical, you've gotta start small and then grow from there. Find your first follower before you think you're going to find your 50,000th follower. So it, it just takes time and it takes usually taking over geographic regions at a time, uh, little by little. And so if you think your strategy really does need a, a, an immediate uh, national or international presence, feel free to touch base with me and I'll happy to give you resources on how to do that in different ways than what I'm talking about here. But generally, that means you have to have a much larger marketing budget uh, because you're going to be doing a lot of advertising. So if you if you have the advertising budget to just pour tons of money into something, then maybe going small won't work for you. But for the vast majority of the rest of you, even if you're a national or international presence business, you probably still want to start locally and start small and grow from there. G build your greatest and best brand advocates, then go from there. And that doesn't mean that you always have to do local business, local source stuff. You may decide that your business has a great deal of interest in Houston, Texas, or in, uh, you know, in Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, fine, you can optimize your local networking in social networks online for those geographic regions. There's no reason why you can't. I'm just saying that trying to say that you're gonna appeal to everybody in the United States or everybody in the world is just too large of a pie for you to conquer. Start small, conquer small spaces, and then grow from there. It doesn't have to be always geographically situated around you physically, but it certainly has to be geographically bounded. So you wanna choose a region. So it may be a metropolitan region, it may be a a rural region where you know your, your buyers are, but you've got to figure out where those regions are and effectively target those regions. And I think small networks are a really fantastic way to do that for the right businesses. So let's get into a survey of those small networks. How What networks have, are available out there in the world? And what I wanted to do was to walk you through some of those. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hop out of my presentation and I am going to take us into full screen mode and then go to our first one. And so the first network I wanted to take you all into, if good old technology would work with me. I don't know why I didn't open this up first, uh, but 
one of the one of the most interesting and uh, thriving networks that are out there in the world is this one. So, uh, and by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to ask Tracy, and I'll be happy to answer regarding kind of reasons for, or if you believe there's a reason against, based on what I talked about, feel free to you know answer, ask the questions in the in the question panel. I'll be happy to go ahead and respond. Uh, but anyway, so. The first one that I wanted to talk to talk about is probably one of the most powerful and uh, because I have about 30 of these to talk to you about <laughs> I'm going to try and go through these pretty quickly as we, as we make our way through uh, this this afternoon's uh, uh, session. So um, the first is, is meetup meetup.com is a uh, is a network that was, uh, you know, started in uh, Brooklyn in the early 2000s and the idea behind meetup is that you are creating local in person meetings around things that people are passionate about and uh and so the idea here is that you are designing a a group uh meetup groups that are are meeting physically locally to do things together to meet and discuss meet and to do activities and that kind of thing uh, meetups are designed actually around the idea of you uh paying for the meetup and so you as the business owner will go ahead and click on start a new group and then you'll be taken through the process of creating one of these meetups and uh, then you'll be able to manage it now some of the some of the good and some of the bad of meetup okay one is that meetup costs money so you're going to have to pay whatever it is 12 or 15 dollars per month uh, for the ability to have that meetup so it does cost money uh, it also is a little bit clunky in some of its uh, the ways in which it manages things as a as a as a meetup organizer, which I am, and I and I've been running uh, several meetups for for many years. The the ability to manage from the mobile device has been a little bit frustrating with the launch of the most recent uh, design. But on the positive side, Meetup provides you with a ready-made audience. There are hundreds of millions of people who are using Meetup every day. And so therefore, you can just easily jump into Meetup and uh, very quickly be connected with those people. So a couple things to think about strategically. One, as a Meetup organizer, you not only have the Meetup members who you are, who you can very hopefully quickly source from setting up a Meetup, but also you can go out there and network with other meetup organizers. One of the really powerful things about meetup is that you can communicate with each other. It's a social network, right? So you can create this um, group, which is its own network, its own community. And so it's a it's an internal social network within meetup, but it's your own space. But you can go to other meetups and you can actually communicate with those other, other organizers to collaborate on events, to collaborate on growing your membership. So if you have another group that's very similar to yours and you want to start your own group, but you want to be able to maybe have some of those members become your members also because there's an affinity there, go ahead and reach out to those other organizers. Figure out ways in which to collaborate and to create marketing opportunities for both of you. Okay, so Meetup is a really fantastic uh, platform for being able to do that. And you can actually create what are called Meetup Networks, where you have multiple meetups within the same, under the same umbrella. So say that you wanna start a meetup in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, one in Charlottesville, uh, one in Roanoke, and one in Richmond. You can do that. You can actually have one in each of those, and then they are under uh, a larger umbrella of the business itself. Okay, next up is a network called Tumblr. And you may know Tumblr, you may not know Tumblr, but they used to be uh, their own thing. Then they were owned by Yahoo, which then became Oath, which is owned by Verizon. And they've gone through quite a number of iterations. Uh, but uh, I still consider them a small social network in the sense that they are designed around the idea of you uh, creating content in this very, very easy way and it gives you the ability to be able to share almost any type of content very, very easily and clearly. So as you can see, uh, the tum a, tumble, uh, a Tumblr is a blog or a tumble log. And the idea is that you have these, uh, not micro posts, but it's close to micro posts, but you can uh, put in uh, visual imagery, you can put in art, you can put in audio, you can put in video, and it's just really, really simple to use. And what I really like about it is that you can actually use your own domain name. So in this way, you can actually 
for free, uh, create a, a blog, a social platform for yourself where you are creating your own identity, controlling the URL, which is just really important and powerful. And yet you're on a platform where people are already gathering. People know Tumblr, people are comfortable with Tumblr. And actually since they've uh, gotten rid of most of the pornography on the platform, now it's a little bit cleaner. Uh, <laughs> um, and there was a, there was a more, uh, there was a younger uh, vibrant community on here that were very focused on, on that kind of, um, you know, explicit content. Uh, but that has all been uh, cleaned up now. And so uh, the, the platform is now, you know, just a, a really, I think, really great place for you to be able to host a very easy small blog. I, I keep a, a small tumble, uh, Tumblr blog for uh, a book club that I run, and it's just really easy to put things up and to change things, and you select a theme, and your community can then engage with it by commenting, posting, resharing your content, and uh, just generally getting access to you through a a contact form system in the in the system, so they can send you messages and you can you can reply and respond to those those messages. A quick point of note, though, when you when you get a message from your public tumbles uh, Tumblr blogs, the um, the the uh, the message chain is public. Um, I, I learned that one the hard way. Um, <laughs> I didn't say anything inappropriate. It's just that someone messaged me and I don't know if they knew that their message was going to be public when I responded to it. And then I was uh, scrolling through the book club blog uh, one day and I noticed, oh, look, I responded to this person about the upcoming meeting and lo and behold, uh, it was public. It was published on the blog. So just be aware of that, that a lot of that stuff is actually uh, publicized when, when you do it. But for example, you can you can launch a podcast here on 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 Tumblr. You can well, you can publish a video uh, video blog, which is really cool uh, here on it. And you know the the hosting costs are zero because it's it's all free. I mean, in essence, um, I I'm I'm constantly shocked when I think about it from that perspective. But yeah, you can you can totally do some really interesting uh, innovative things. You can have a chat uh, a public chat you know, space on your on your Tumblr blog. You can have uh, specific instances. If anyone knows what a tweet chat is, you can host a tweet chat here. Really, really cool platform. And so if your target market is in that space, you can definitely uh, check out Tumblr and uh, see if that's something that you'd like to do. Okay, taking a quick uh, uh, step away from the typical ones, uh, Mix is actually fairly new, but it's also fairly old. So Mix uh, is the new social network that was uh, was used as a replacement for StumbleUpon. So StumbleUpon used to be this content curation website, and it had a very rich, storied history. And uh, Mix was, uh, you know, was bought and sold, and and so on and so forth. And ultimately, uh, the idea was to shut it down and start a new platform. And Mix is the platform that has been designed. Uh, to replace stumble upon, stumble upon. And so the idea here is that if you are attempting to curate lots of sources, very similar to Pinterest, I suppose, but without all of the headache, you know, Pinterest requires you to, to constantly generate new images and curate content in a way that uh, really needs to feed the beast. Mix is a little bit different because you're you're using the internet as your curation curation source, not images specifically. And so, as we talked about in the in the Pinterest webinar, I can go back and check that out in the archives. You need to create images, and those images then need to go onto your website, and you need to source them from your own content. Uh, Mix doesn't require you to do all of that, so you can just create content on your website and then share it to a mix collection. And so that allows you to be able to uh, share this kind of content, create collections around these things, and uh, it's just as simple as uh, you know, creating an account. And I don't know why, but um, they currently only allow you to sign up with one of those services without creating your own username and password, which is whatever. Uh, but the idea here is then you can create a collection and someone can follow that collection and then you all can have a conversation around this type of content and that can create a really rich vibrant community if what you're 
business is about is sharing and collaborating around a specific topic. So this is for a very specific type of business. So if you if your business is about sharing and collaborating around a particular topic, then this could be very useful. It could also be a, a useful tangential piece to your community. So it can be another social network piece and component, right? So if you have your, your main component, which is your meetup, but you want a place where your, your meetup members can then uh, share and collaborate things that they're finding and things that you're finding together on the web in a centralized repository, this can be a really uh, useful tool for being able to do that. Okay, uh, I just wanted to spend a short amount of time uh, talking about Foursquare. So a lot of people think that uh, Foursquare is, um, uh, is dead and it's not. So Foursquare is actually really remarkable in its growth. So Foursquare became Foursquare and it was this, you know, very popular and uh, very, um, you know, uh, widely used tool. Uh, and then all of a sudden they seem to have just dropped off the face of the planet. <laughs> they developed an application that I'm gonna talk about shortly, but in essence, they seem to have gone away. But they really didn't go away. What they did was they uh, changed their, their paradigm. They went to this, which is Foursquare for Business. And I'll take a moment here to let everybody know that I actually have, I will be sharing with Tracy the slide deck and in the slides are links to all of these networks. So they're on the surveys of small uh, social networks uh, slide. There are links to all of these social networks that I'm talking about. So don't worry about, you know, the URLs and all that kind of stuff. I've, I've provided those all in the, uh, the notes uh, for uh, the presentation. So don't worry about that. Uh, so anyway, so there's Foursquare for Business. And uh, so Foursquare for Business is one of those components, just taking a step away from small social networks for a moment, but just being aware of how it plays into the next application. So when, when you are active on uh, Google, for example, you're writing content and Google's finding your content, you can also then advertise using Google Ads, as we talked about in the last webinar on Google Ads. And uh, and so you have the ability to both be in organic and in the advertising search engine results page mixture. Well, Foursquare for Business is, is really the ability for you to do that uh, on, on the Foursquare platform. So I just wanted to point this out because if you are a business who, which is local and you're trying to, be able, trying to drive uh, retail traffic into your store, then you need to be able to understand where your customers are, why they are, and uh, you know why they're showing up in your business. And Foursquare now has the data underpinning many, many apps. So Foursquare is now sitting in the background of all of these other applications that users have on their mobile devices and not just their own app, but many other apps. And they're, they're collecting this data about uh, what people are doing, understanding their buyer intents and uh, understanding their, their engagement with retail spaces. And then they're feeding that into this engine so that they can better put you in front of your business, in front of those customers at the right times. So that leads us to Swarm. So Swarm is, the, is what Foursquare used to be. So Foursquare used to be, you are on a social network, you connect with your friends, you connect with people that you know, and you check in, you check into a location and you say, oh, by the way, I'm at this museum and I'm in the museum shop and look at these beautiful things. You can add photographs, you can add context to the environment, and then other people can, could see that content. Now, uh, uh, Google, and Facebook both got into the market. Google Maps now allows people to add and contribute content and review locations. Facebook has Facebook Local and the idea for uh, Facebook uh, people to check in into local environments on Facebook as well. So events and locations are, are captured in that. But Foursquare Swarm is one of those small social networks where if, for example, you're a tour guide or if you work in an environment where the physical or geographic location around you is really important. You can actually build a community, a small community that is highly engaged by getting them to do things in real life environments. And so just 
keep that in mind as you as you move your way along because Swarm and what Foursquare is doing with all the other applications, it's, it collects all of this data. So, uh, so some of you may know that there's a new Harry Potter game that's augmented reality that's coming out, especially those of you who have uh, children. And, uh, and so the Harry Potter game is coming out and it's gonna be huge, right? It's gonna be really, really popular. Well, guess where Google and all of these other uh, game designers are getting their location data from. They're getting it from Foursquare because Foursquare built up all of this data and is connected to all of these apps. And so they're all sharing this information, whether you like the privacy implications of this or not, they're sharing this information. And so Swarm is a way for you to be able to get in the mix and see if your community is there or if you can build your community there because you're not gonna have a lot of competition from other people jumping onto Swarm itself. Swarm isn't going anywhere. Uh, you know, Foursquare has a, a vested interest in keeping it running, but there's not a lot of um, strong competition for uh, your competitors to really be on Swarm as well. So you can grow a community right there in plain sight without having a lot of competition. So that's why I like the idea of Swarm for the right business. Okay, next up is an oldie but a goodie, and it is Reddit. Um, so Reddit actually fits into line with a, a series of social networks that are that are really Q and A style, uh, and the idea here is um, these networks are designed around. Uh, in Reddit, they're called subreddits, and so you have these larger uh, uh, conversation spaces, and then you have smaller conversation spaces that are more granular on topic. And that means for your business, uh, you know, say that you are in the shoe business, you can type into shoes into the into the Reddit platform. You can see that there's a, a, a subreddit for uh, shoes, okay? So there's a category for shoes and uh, there are not that many members of shoes there, uh, of members for shoes there, but maybe you can go ahead and find a particular place where uh, fashion is more of the conversation. So then you can go say to fashion and, uh, and then you can keep drilling down and uh, going to, to different places. So here, Streetwear has a million members. And, uh, and so that's, that becomes a little bit more um, useful to you um, as you start to drill down to maybe a subreddit that is about uh, you know, your particular type of shoe wear that you sell in your boutique. And, the, um, and then you can start talking about your boutique um, in the conversation, in the community. If there isn't one that already exists, then you can actually create that community. You can create that subreddit and then uh, start to curate and manage the community and um, invite members to it from the larger communities down to yours and really create a vibrant space for you to be able to do that. And so Reddit has a mobile application. A lot of people don't know that. And so the mobile application is really good for you to be able to manage this, these types of communities on the go. And so just remember that you have, have the ability to go ahead and create your own uh, you know, Reddit community and create subreddits that are much more granular. And uh, you know, Reddit has many, many users, but the idea is, is to create a, a subset that really focuses on your business and your industry in your maybe geographic location, if that makes a lot of sense for you. So it's all about being able to, to do that. So if anybody has any um, uh, questions about that, that would be good as well. Um, all right, next up, staying in that same vein of, of the Q&A style space, right? So a lot of people on, on Reddit will ask questions and then people will answer those questions or they'll bring up topics and that will lead to all kinds of other things. Um, so here um, is a, a site called Quora and they are explicitly all about questions. You know, they're not, more, they're not necessarily about uh, making a statement and having someone respond to that statement, although the questions in essence are the same thing, but these are all in question style. So think Jeopardy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the idea here is that um, here goes a, a, a topic that I love, no one love is Evernote. And so if we come to the Evernote page, you can see all the people with questions around Evernote. And so just like with Reddit, Quora is for those of you who are maybe service businesses as well, who are subject matter experts, thought leaders. And what you do is you can search Quora and Reddit and, and these, this, this, this class of, of social networks and start to create a following of people who are interested in the topics you're answering. So uh, we're actually in my account now, it auto logged me in. Uh, but the idea here is that um, when we go through here, we could say, okay, well, um, 
which is one of the which one is the perfect alternative to Evernote and you can uh, click on this question and then you can answer it right and so here let's just click on what is Evernote for so here you can see that this person asked a, a the question and um, there's five answers to this question and you can provide scroll down to the bottom here and you can um, I'm sorry you can um, scroll up here and click answer and you can actually provide your own answer to the question. And so it actually becomes very, very powerful to be able to, um, to answer the question. You can answer questions anonymously, although that's not really necessary if you're trying to market your business. Uh, but the idea here is that you're able to then go in and write your own answer, and it's like a blog post. So it's just this ongoing uh, you know, blogging that you can do, but it's based on things that people actually want answers to. Someone out there in the world uh, sat down and said, I need, a, I need an answer to this question. And so just keep that in mind that this is, this is, uh, this is so powerful in, in so many ways. I also like this network because it actually helps me understand I'm fearful always to click on uh, when I'm logged into my account uh, because sometimes the questions could be uh, fairly uh, foolish. So I'm just going to click on the answer page because hopefully that will be less. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So um, so the idea here is that uh, I look through Quora to see questions that might actually be really great blog content for me to write for the blog, for my own company blog. So I'll, I'll sift through here and say, oh, well, you know what? This was really popular as a question. Maybe this is something that I want to, to contribute to here on Quora, uh, but then I'll write a blog post about it on my own website, on my own blog, or do a podcast episode about it, and then link to it from the Quora answer. So now I'm giving giving a, a a succinct answer there in Quora, but then I'm going to flush it out in more detail and engage my audience more highly in and on the blog or podcast. So this gives me two different things to do. One is I'm I'm generating new followers on Quora, so more and more people who like my content and like what I'm writing about follow me, and therefore I can engage them in different ways. Uh, but then on the other side is that. I can then uh, lead them to website traffic for my business by leading them away from Quora and to my, my content. Now, what, what I mean by engaging them when I have something new is that when, you, when someone follows you on Quora, uh, you have the ability to, uh, to, to create different um, taglines, different profile titles for answering a particular question. Uh, so, so I'll just click here. And so you can see if I want to answer this question, in what ways do to-do lists harm productivity? And um, I, have a, I have a particular opinion about this, but beyond that, um, you can see here that it has my name and then it has a title. It tells people what it is that it thinks. And I can edit the credential and you can see here that I can change this to a particular thing, right? So here I can change this to an Evernoter, change it to uh, any number of things. So you can see that I've been an Evernoter since 2009, and I've been an Evernote certified consultant since 2015. And so you can actually change those things according to the various item. Now, when when people see that, that's really useful, especially if they're following you. But say that I have a new book coming out. Well, I can actually change my credential uh, and say, uh, you know, author of XYZ book and a, and a little URL uh, to that book when I do publish the book and that way people can actually see that and my, the people who follow me will now be able to see that update and they'll say, oh, that's interesting and then head over to uh, wherever uh, I, they can buy the book. So there are ways in which you can subtly uh, shift the conversation to help people understand that there are new things and in the credentials is a way that you can do it. It's kind of a, a pro tip there. Okay, next up is Medium. Okay, so Medium is uh, the birth child of the creator of both uh, Twitter and Blogger, or Blogger, uh, which which was Blogspot, and then uh, and then ultimately uh, Twitter. And so uh, he decided to create Medium, and uh, Medium is really an interesting social network because it's about really long form content. Uh, and so long form content, there there is a pricing model here. So you can publish content for free to some extent, and then you'll probably need to pay for it. You can also change the URL so you can actually own the domain. 
which again is really, really important if you're gonna do a lot of work on a social network and the social network goes away, it's really nice to be able to to own the own the domain that way you can redirect the content you know you can download the content put it someplace else and redirect it should it ever go away uh, but the idea here is that uh, medium allows for multiple really powerful tools for being able to engage your social network now what you do here is you create a new post and you're writing along with your post well you can actually uh, engage collaborators in the creation process and if you've heard me talk about social media in the past you know that for me, social media is a part of community building, and community building means that you need to have contribution from your community. I'm going to talk about that you know, near the end of our, our discussion. Uh, and so the idea here is that you go onto Medium and you invite people, brand advocates, influencers, people who you believe are going to be able to share and uh, uh, you know, use network effect to broadcast your message to, to a larger community of people. And you can invite them to the conversation and they can contribute parts to a blog post. They can provide commentary and all kinds of other fun stuff. Well, once you post a Medium post, it automatically gives attribution to those people and they are then able to uh, you know, share your content out. But because they've been a part of it, they have buy-in. And because they have buy-in, they're much more likely to share your content to more people than just a normal blog post that you publish on your blog and then you you put it out into the world and then it just sits there, right? Maybe Google indexes it and shows it to some people, but you want, you, if you're gonna blog, you want people who have buy-in, who have that level of, of interest in being able to get, get that content out into the world. And so I really like Medium for the ability for you to just seamlessly invite collaborators to the content and then broadcast that content out to the world that way. The, 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 Medium platform also provides you with a, a just a very slick way for you to be able to have people follow you and also for you to highlight content and comment just on the highlighted com content so that you're not making comments all at the bottom of the post. You're commenting directly in line with the exact thing you're commenting on. So the conversation is much more fluid as you're reading the actual blog. So you're getting context right along with the commentary. And uh, and Medium has multiple email newsletters that they send out under different categories. And so people actually get uh, emails uh, to, to people beyond the community that just follows you because it's going out to people who might be interested in your content as well. Now there are some pay gate problems, you know, where you know, Medium is making some folks pay for content over a certain amount of reading, and there's some there are some issues there. Uh, but for the most part, I think that if you are trying to to build a small network on a platform where you're really trying to get uh, collaboration to create the content, this is a really great tool uh, to consider. Uh, right before you go on, um, yeah. I did have a, a question. I thought Medium no longer allows you to use your own domain URL. Um, not that I'm aware of. I will, I will, uh, let's see here. I will look that up and I will uh, make a note in the slide deck about that. But my understanding is that that is still possible. Okay. It's just a, it's just a paid feature. And I'm looking it up right now. Yeah, I guess she, the, the person looked it up and said they're correct. If you didn't already have a domain claimed in 2017, you're out of luck. But I don't know if that means that you can still pay to do it. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking it up right now in the help article, and yeah, you you can still create your own publication URL. But it looks as though you're actually right. They actually turned off that feature. Thank you so much. Sorry, folks. You cannot create your own URL anymore. Um, you can create a publication. So it'll be medium.com forward slash publication you know, whatever your publication name is, um, but the, but you can't actually use a custom domain anymore. Boo. Uh, yeah, so if you had an existing one, then then nothing's changing, but they're turned, they turned it off for others. Um, in, in that case, by the way, so in the, the, uh, the way to overcome that is to actually just create a C name record under, underneath your own business name. So it'll be uh, medium.yourbusinessname.com and then direct it to the medium.com forward slash publication name URL, okay? So you can, at least on your marketing side, anything that you're publishing about Medium, you can actually use that that single domain to drive people to the, the Medium site. And that way, should it ever change, you can still just keep using the old domain and, uh, and direct people away from Medium 
uh, to someplace else should you decide to leave the platform. Uh, but yeah, so thank you for that correction. Okay, moving along, um, Alignable is a fairly new network. Uh, so we know, uh, most people know about LinkedIn, which is owned by Microsoft. Uh, but uh, link, uh, Alignable is a small business social network that is much more local business focused. So when you sign up for Alignable, you are, and then create a, a business profile, and that business profile is geographically situate, and then you network with your local businesses around you. You can give recommendations, uh, you know, in essence, give, uh, you know, little testimonials about uh, business owners and businesses that you work with. You can receive those as well and then network and refer business among different business owners. Uh, the platform is uh, unique. I think it's a little bit, the user experience is a little bit cluttered, uh, but it's also pretty powerful. I've seen a lot of, of people really uh, go deep into Alignable and get a lot of benefit out of it. So I highly recommend uh, people who are, again, local businesses who are trying to get, uh, you know, network with other local businesses in order to, to and, you know, create a, a stronger marketing impact. Uh, it, it for me, it really seems like it's small business to small business networking. So if you're a B two B business in a small business, you know, uh, if you're a small business in a B two B environment, this is a little bit more powerful for you than say if you're, you know, a uh, again going back to the shoe boutique. If you're a shoe boutique and you're not selling, uh, you know, work shoes to local, you know, places that have have a need for uniforms or something like that. Uh, it's not going to be as useful for you, uh, but in the in the B two B small business space, it seems like a pretty powerful network, and it seems like a lot of people are uh, signing on to it. So in the in the B two B space, check it out. Okay, taking a, a a minor shift away from traditional social networks again, I wanted to uh, let everybody know about the fact that um, we're in a we're in a state of social where more and more social networks are going to social messaging platforms. So instead of it being a uh, a Facebook page where you are posting and everybody can see it, there is much more of this idea of having one-to-one -one conversations with people. And so we're seeing a, a toggling between those. Telegram is an open source platform that gives us a, a different kind of experience here. Telegram has different levels of social. So they have a one-to-one -one capacity. So uh, I use Telegram every day in my life and I, I message with colleagues and, and clients using Telegram because it allows for secure conversations back and forth. And uh, there's a desktop version, there's mobile version. What I really love is that there's a web version. So I could just go to web.telegram.org wherever I am and I can log in and then uh, have all of my conversations there. And I don't need to install an application on the device or anything. I just really can access those conversations from anywhere. And uh, so Telegram is really powerful for that. It's free. And uh, then it goes up a step and you can create what are called Telegram groups. So say, for example, you are a small business coach and or, or a life coach. Let's say you're a life coach and you want to be able to do life coaching for a small group community of people. Well, you can create a Telegram group and that your clients will pay and then you give them access to Telegram, this, this private group, and voila, you now have the ability to have those people share and collaborate. You can uh, voice message, you can video message, you can share content, you can chat live. All of those things can happen right there in the Telegram space. And then beyond that, you can have what are called Telegram channels. Now channels are in essence a public broadcasting space. So you can have public and private groups. So you can have the, the private groups for paid clients, public groups for, for just general people who wanna follow you in, in here and everybody can sort of, you know, engage in the conversation. And then you have channels, which is really a broadcast medium. So it's really where you can send out broadcast messages to a larger community. So if you have a really, really large community where you want to get just messages out to them and then have Telegram groups where people can in interact and engage with one another, you can actually do that all in Telegram, all inside of this chat app, which is really, really powerful. Okay, next up is the anti-Facebook. So MeWe is one of those platforms that has come out of it. So is Discord. I didn't I didn't put that as, as one of my, my uh, items to review today, but Discord is another one. It's a little bit more techy and a little bit more geeky, so I didn't really want to go there. Uh, but, the, uh, but MeWe is, in essence, a Facebook clone, and they are in the space to promote 
uh, privacy and to say that they actually are not for sale, right? So that's why your private life is not for sale. And so they have the ability to have you create your own social networking profile. You can create a business profile. W3 Consulting has a profile there on MeWe and you can find us. And, uh, and so we can now publish our content there as a business page and the users know that we're not paying MeWe to get in front of you you know, no, no advertiser is going to come on the platform and uh, get data from MeWe in order to properly target you or anything like that. Um, they have other ways in which they're going to monetize the content, but it's all based on this idea of data privacy and making sure that you control your data. So that's it. It's, it's decent. There's clearly features it doesn't have that Facebook does, and they're working on it every day. And, you know, it's still a new platform. But uh, for example, uh, when Google Plus uh, you know, deprecated and shut down. Uh, we, my family had a, had a, had a little group that we had been running within Google plus, and we decided to take that Google plus community and move it to MeWe uh, because uh, my brother, my, my older brother is very privacy minded and very data privacy uh, focused. And I love that about him. And so he said, you know, we're not going to Facebook. <laughs> and, uh, and so I said, okay, well, let's find a network where we can um, privately share photographs about just us in a private community. And so we created a family community there in MeWe. And so all of the family members have MeWe on their mobile phones and now we can share and interact. And, you know, I get pictures of my adorable niece, uh, you know, playing and she, she does a lot of clam digging out there in Seattle. And <laughs> I get to see all of it. I get to see videos and, and all that other fun stuff in a space where I know that her privacy rights aren't being impacted. Uh, and, and so if you have a very privacy focused audience, and uh, and you want to create a really you know uh, focused community around uh, things that might be uh, sensitive for them to be sharing. Maybe might be for you and your audience. Okay, now we're moving into a class of creating social networks from scratch and you owning the social network. So. Uh, what we've talked about so far are platforms that allow you to be able to create social networks on their platforms. And Ning and the next few that I'll be talking about really talk about the idea of creating social networks where you, you are running your own network. So no longer are you a part of some network you know, smaller groups within the larger platform, like a Facebook group or a Facebook page. Now you are creating your own network where you control all the pieces of that network. Okay, so like even with MeWe, if you create a community within MeWe or or group or page for your business, it's still on MeWe.com. Uh, in in essence, with Ning, you're on Ning.com, but you run all of the features of it. So instead of just running a community, you're running the whole entire, like instead of running a Facebook group, it's like creating a whole new Facebook, right? So it's like the entire thing. And so Ning is the, the, the grandmother of all, uh, you know, social networks in that sense. Um, so this is a social networking tool to be able to create your own social networking platform. And so they have a lot of really great features. And um, the idea behind any one of these, if you're just thinking about creating your own social network is, are you, thinking about creating a social network where you can, it keeps asking me to accept those cookies, which I don't want to do, um, you, can, uh, you can create your own content that lives on your own platform. Your community then can, then can then share their own content on this platform with one another. And really the, the, the dividing line for me is, are you trying to monetize the community? Are you trying to, are you trying to make the community valuable to you and running the community is a part of the revenue model for the business. So no longer is it just trying to get people to be interested in your business and driving traffic to your website and blog in order to convert them sales-wise to the, to the actual business services, but is the community your business? Is, is being a community manager your business? So for example, in one area of my life, really being a, the community manager, being able to share with them my expertise and bring those people together well, that's, that's, that can be its own business. So I might decide that it's bringing those people together ar around this topic is I should get paid for that. And so uh, I might charge people for that. And that's what these social networks are for. It's, it's, it's the value of bringing those people together that makes it capable of being monetized. 
there's several ways you could do that. You can monetize them by charging people to be a part of the, of the network, to be able to join the network itself. You can charge for events. You can charge for doing uh, digital content, whether that be uh, you know, charging them to put content on the site. Uh, that can include uh, digital courses, if you wanna be able to charge people for digital courses. Um, have people run a group. Say you, you have uh, the social network and you want someone to run a smaller group. So say you are, let's go back to the, the life coaching example. Say you wanna create a network of life coaches and those life coaches bring their own coaching clients into their own private groups. You're managing the entire community, but the life coaches get the ability to create their own smaller groups where their clients live and, and, and engage with them. And you're doing that all inside of the platform. So you're getting paid by the life coaches. The members are paying the life coaches for access to their own uh, you know, life coach, but it's within this whole entire platform. So think about the way in which this scales for you, because this can be very, very powerful for being able to create uh, an e-commerce platform around membership. Okay, moving on to now my favorite in this class of social network platforms, and uh, it's Mighty Networks. Mighty Networks is a platform where you can create a membership-based uh, community, and um, and and so. Uh, the idea here is that you uh, create the Mighty Network and you go ahead and um, start inviting your community to it. Um, there's an iOS and Android app, just like with Ning. And so people can now uh, go in there. You can start for free with a free platform and you can immediately start charging people for entering. Now, Mighty Networks is in the process of being able to enhance the tools so that uh, say that I want free members but I want to create a digital course and it has an ability for you to do digital courses and to create events in the platform uh, and also live chats and uh, all kinds of other fun things. And so the idea here is that I want to be able to charge for events, but I want people to join my platform for free. It's just that if they're going to attend a, an event, whether that's virtual or in person, I want them to pay for that. Right now, you can't do that very easily. You can, but it takes a little bit more work than I think it should. Well, they're in the process of making that happen, like literally in the next month or two, uh, they're supposed to be scaling out these, these uh, new features for people to be able to uh, do that. Uh, the interface is clean, it's modern. Uh, Ning is a little bit dated, a little bit clunky in some ways. Not that it can't look good, you, you can work to make it re look really well. Uh, I think Mighty Networks is just this beautiful interface. It looks uh, beautiful, it's modern, and uh, you can have multiple networks and you can create multiple groups within a Mighty Network. So for example, I actually run a Mighty Network for my little community in my personal productivity world. And so uh, as you all know, I love personal productivity. And so I have a personal productivity space and I have lots of groups in that space and many of them are are private groups. So the rest of the community doesn't even see that they exist, but I'm running those groups privately for those smaller communities, you know, like a mastermind group or otherwise, I'm running them in the background. And so it's all running in Mighty Network. So instead of me as a business owner having to be everywhere trying to interact with people on Facebook here and, and Twitter here and, and Pinterest here, I've just said, okay, if everybody wants to interact with me, this is where I'm I'm going to be. You come to this space, there's iOS and Android app and the web desktop app, and this is where you can find me. And it's been so, so powerful for me to not have to go everywhere to interact and engage with people. So I've just told people, this is where I'm at. And if you'd like to find me, this is where you can find me for discussion around personal productivity. And now all of that is concentrated inside of a space. So if your business is designed around not necessarily content marketing, but creating content that's bespoke for a specific community and you potentially want to charge them for it, uh, create digital courses and events around that topic, you can actually turn off the content marketing part if you already have an audience and community and use this purely as a con community management tool and it becomes very, very powerful. So, you know, you would have a website separate from this and a blog separate from this potentially for the content marketing side, but for really managing your community and making it a vibrant experience, uh, Mighty Networks can really be powerful. Okay, I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go much quicker through these last 10 or so items. Uh, there's maybe more than 10. So um, Tracy, you know how to, you're gonna have to yank me off stage, but, um, <laughs> um, but here we go. Okay, so uh, groups is a, um, as it says, it's a censor censorship free social network. Um, so this is a little bit more of in the open uh, source space. And this allows you to create your own social platform. And it's, uh, 
it's a really interesting concept. Um, I have not had a chance to play with it as much as I would like to, but the idea here is that it's a, uh, a, a hosted uh, version, but you can always uh, go ahead and, and leave the platform. And uh, again, you have to pay for this, um, you know, so there, there's, a, there's a cost to it because, you know, you're hosting a platform, but that means you own your data and you can do all of that. Uh, but the platform is actually really, really interesting. And you can, you can take uh, Bitcoin payments. And so you can take cryptocurrency payments. It's a very, very interesting uh, idea here. But if you're interested in, uh, again, privacy and, um, and not being censored by these larger platforms, say that you, you are posting about content that might be a little bit taboo or um, you feel like are, is censored because uh, because of a misunderstanding about keywords or whatever, this is the kind of place where you can create your own space and have open conversation and dialogue with your community. Okay, Social Go, uh, I think this is, is uh, uh, UK based and um, it's another one of these uh, build your own social network. Again, it's been around for a long time. It may actually be even older than, uh, than uh, Ning, but either way, Social Go is there. I think it's a little bit clunky, uh, but again, it, you can you can play around with the features, and and if it has the right feature feature set for your business, then then it has the fight, right feature set. And I care about more about its its ability to do what you need it to do than I care about your um, about really aesthetics. I mean, it just looks like Facebook in a in a in a in a platform, right? So it's a little bit of a Facebook uh, clone in that sense. Uh, but you can see it has a lot of good features. It has the ability for you to have membership subscriptions, and you can even do advertising within it, which is I think is a very interesting um, additional component. So that if you have sponsors of the network, and that's how you pay your members are, for, are come in for free, but your but you then place ads on the network. That is that's a potential model that might work for you. Okay, um, Spruce is another one. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but I know that there's quite a number of social networks out there that use um, Spruce. It's another build your own social network component. So that's just nothing, nothing fancy about that. Okay, um, DeviantArt. DeviantArt is a company that is really old. Um, it's been around for probably up 20 years now, 18, 18 to 20 years. And it's really about the art community. And, uh, and so if you're in the art space, and the next, the next few of these are actually all arts, art focused uh, platforms, by the way. So if you're an artist and you're interested in, in the art community, DeviantArt is um, there. The uh, reason for joining it would probably be because it's owned by Wix now. And so there's gonna be a lot of tight integration between Wix and DeviantArt. So if you're interested in you know, uh, turning your website into more social and connecting the two social pieces, this may be a good way to do that. Next up. Is Ello okay? So Ello is this really small network that is all about artists, and what I like about it is the interface is just really smooth and clean, and there's this very hip urban feel to it. So again, if your audience is that kind of hip urban young crowd that's doing a lot in in the uh, kind of high art space, as you can see just from the design aesthetic and everything else like that, it's a very clean, uh, very you know. Uh, crisp, high-end luxury art space. Uh, this is a really fantastic social network to be able to uh, dip your toe into and see whether or not uh, this would be a space for you as well. Okay, so whereas DV and art focuses maybe a little bit on the tattoo artist community and 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 a wide variety of different kinds of of web skinning, uh, the the folks here at Ello has a much wider place and wider you know uh, birth of 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 artist spaces. Uh, but it seems like it's a little bit more high-end. But I could be wrong but you know test it out okay Vero is a space where uh, right now it's free but the whole idea behind it is that you would pay to be a member of Vero and ultimately then they don't have to be Facebook because you're paying to be on the social network so they don't have to uh, sell your data and so going back to kind of MeWe, MeWe is, is has a has a different perspective on it you know they're gonna sell uh, other things and uh, make money uh, through MeWe Pro, uh, selling services to businesses that want to have MeWe Pro accounts. Uh, Vero is saying that the individual users would pay and have access to this network. And right now, it seems to be very high-end, uh, you know, kind of magazines, high-end publications, as well as uh, artists, um, you know, major, uh, you know, artists out there, music artists and otherwise who are on Vero right now. Uh, but you can totally do it. And I believe they're currently free. So if you join for free now, you get a free account for life. Uh, and then after that, people will start paying. So it's worthy of checking out. Okay, TikTok is a new one, and um, and it's definitely one of those uh, that are very popular in 
uh, in Asia right now, but it's for the artist who wants to do short uh, music videos. So if you're in the music space and you want to do some music videos, or if whatever you're doing is very visually associated and you want to do short video, this is this is kind of the, the network uh, for you. Um, at this point, I am going to exit out of here and just look at where I'm at. Um, okay, so I've got a whole bunch of other links in here. I'm going to cover two more one more, and then the rest of the links are in the system. Okay, so um, very, very quickly, if you're on a WordPress website and you already get a lot of traffic to your current WordPress website, and by a lot of traffic, it just means you have a highly engaged audience, so you get 50 people to your website a month, uh, but if they're a highly engaged audience, that's a lot. Um, and you can actually use this plugin called BuddyPress. BuddyPress can turn your WordPress website into a social network. So it creates an instant online community where you can have uh, community managers and groups of people, and they can all interact and, and engage. There are themes and plugins specifically developed for BuddyPress. Very, very powerful. So if you already have a community that's visiting your website, you don't need to direct them someplace else in order to engage them. You can actually do that right there in WordPress. You do have to have a hosting account that can support the amount of work that's involved in BuddyPress running everything. But if you wanna be able to do that, you can totally do it. Pri private messages, you can extend BuddyPress in all kinds of ways. If, you're, if you have a developer who can build onto it as well, you can do that and you can create membership models. You can do some really, really powerful stuff with BuddyPress, but just know that it exists. Okay, and um, okay, just for time, the rest of the things that I talked about are in there. And if uh, Tracy will just bear in, uh, bear with me for just another two minutes, I wanted to cover uh, very, very quickly um, some of the things you wanna consider as you are making your way through uh, choosing some of the networks. And I covered a whole bunch of networks and there's lots of, of tools out there. Like I said, they're in the links in the slide. Uh, but what you wanna really focus on as you start out is what are your, what is or are your community goal or goals? And, and that's really gonna be the, the, the test of which one of these may be something that you wanna think about in your own business. So really consider what, what are your goals? Sit down and map out. Are we trying to uh, create a community to monetize that community? Are we trying to create a community so that we can drive website traffic, which means we wanna go someplace where there's already a community and we're actually just segmenting away a group of those those users to us. Um, and the way that you do that is do some social listening. Go to those places. So the, the websites that I've listed, along with Facebook and the others, uh, go out there and do some social listening. Search for people you know, people that are in your community, and see whether or not your community is there. Are the people who are the influencers, the movers and shakers in your space, are they there already? Are they interacting? Are they engaging? More importantly to me are two things. Are they sharing? to or from there. That is, when I'm on Twitter and reviewing people who are, who are interacting on Twitter, I'm curious whether or not they are sharing things from another social network to Twitter or whether they're actually creating content on Twitter directly there and um, potentially sharing it out of that space. Because the place where they are, are natively engaging is more important to me than the places where they're sharing, than where they're basically just reviewing and sharing from, okay? So pay attention to that. If I'm, if I'm actively engaging on Twitter um, and all I'm doing is sharing to Facebook, I'm not really engaging on Facebook, I'm not creating content directly onto Facebook, then it's much more likely that I like Twitter. And you should be aware of that because then if there's enough people there, then that's the case. And that's the same thing with MeWe or you know, any of these other uh, social networks that we talked about. And next, am I engaging there? Engagement is more than just sharing, right? It's whether I'm commenting, whether I'm talking to other people, having conversations with those people. And really this leads me to my final thought on all this is what is your community's cont contribution strategy? And contribution goes beyond likes and comments. It comes down to how do you bring those community members into the fold to make them do the operations of the community. So at some point in any community, it goes from having a leader to having a leadership team. Because if there is only one leader who's always doing everything, then the community is not being elevated in some way, shape or form to have some level of responsibility for the operation of the community, which means that the community is fairly weak. So if I'm constantly doing everything and always speaking, and my community is not taking some responsibility, 
then they're not as committed to my community and therefore not committed to buying from me. And that's what I want to really impress upon you is how do you engage your community up the scale there to make them be more interested in being able to contribute to the community. You know, maybe you, you appoint a few people who are moderators to your community who are capable of, of not only guiding, but also being brand evang evangelists, being people who can answer questions. Uh, to some extent, they're doing a little bit of customer service for you in, in that way, right? Uh, but the idea here is to, is to figure out what contribution means to your community and ultimately what is your contribution strategy. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tracy and I'm happy to answer any questions and as I said the slides are going to go to, to, uh, to Tracy and she will share that with you and that has links to all the other stuff I talked about. Great thanks Ray. Thanks everyone for participating today. Today's webinar was recorded and will be posted on the Virginia SBDC website under live webinars and recordings. Tomorrow you'll receive a follow-up email on the webinar with an evaluation link. Um, please help us to continue to improve our training by taking the time to complete the evaluation. I also posted it in the chat window um, if you would like to fill that evaluation out now. And we did have some questions, so um, let me start with um, how do you leverage the content marketing via Mighty Networks from an SEO perspective? Or are you saying Mighty Networks could be good in lieu of hosting your content on your website? Yeah, so, so Mighty Networks or any of the others that I'm talking about um, in terms of the create your own social network, I really look at it from the perspective of you're monetizing your community in some way, shape or form. It's the next step above content marketing. So you would, you would be and have your own website where you are doing the content marketing. So that's where you would have your blog, that's where you would have a podcast, that's where you would have any other content that you were trying to drive traffic to and the conversion for you would to, to convert people from being a casual blog, podcast, you know, le reader, listener, and otherwise into being a community member on the Mighty Network. And then the Mighty Network is supposed to be where they pay you, right? Whether that's for membership, whether that's for a digital course, whether that's to come to an event, whether that's for um, small, uh, you know, being able to join a smaller group within Mighty Networks where you then pay for maybe mastermind, uh, group coaching, one-to-one -one coaching, um, you know, a one-to-one -one service of some kind uh, where you provide that service within that space. So Mighty Networks is, is where you do conversion. The the conversion on the website side is, is them to the community. Uh, could you repeat the tip about the, with Medium, the C name thing? Sure. Sure. So a, a C name or a subdomain, you would talk to your, your web, you know, domain registrar for this is just to create a, a word like in this case, medium, uh, medium dot your business name dot com. And that would redirect that would forward when someone typed that into their URL bar, or clicked on it on your website, they would forward to a, another web address, which in essence would be your medium current medium publication URL. And that way, should that ever change, you have control because you're directing people from your website to a domain that you control, which is the medium.yourbusinessname.com URL. I'd like to know which of these or organizations are okay with you selling through them or do you need to hide it? Well, again, in, in all of the ones that I talked about that were social networks that, that are call them social networks in a box, right? Uh, the ones that are you creating your own social network, those all have their own monetization models. So they are designed for you to be able to to sell to those people. Uh, for the for all the others that I talked about, uh, that ends up being a, a, a more customized approach. Um, none of them, uh, I think, say anything. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've read all the terms of service of all of these services. So um, I'm, I'm running through a catalog in my mind of any ones that I might not have read. Um, certainly, I've not read all of the international ones that are in the slides, so don't don't quote me on any of those. But all the other ones, you are are absolutely capable of saying, you know, buy from me right now. Whether that's effective or not is not is not particularly useful. So, you know, it ends up being a strategy for being able to drive traffic to somewhere where you can sell them. You know, this is different than buying an Instagram ad where someone can click on a on a on a product inside of an Instagram photograph or video and be taken directly to a shopping cart that has that product in it. Uh, your, your, your social network and social networking is about community building and the community building should be for driving someone to 
a, a space where you can then sell them a product where they should be persuaded to want to buy your services. So no, there's not a limitation. You can just say, hey, how's it going? Thanks for following me, buy my product uh, or service. Uh, but the likelihood of them doing it is very low until they've gotten to know you, know, like, and trust you as they say, and, and then you can facilitate a purchase but you, that usually means them taking a step further beyond just the social network. That probably means them coming to your website, looking at your services and being sold in some other way, shape or form. So develop a sales strategy, a sales methodology for how you convert people from, from once they're interested in your product. And then think about social networking as a marketing, is developing and fostering leads. And I would hope that those leads become community members because those are repeat buyers and those are people who will on an ongoing basis advocate for your brand. Great. And then the last question, she also like some practical examples how this could work for accountants or bookkeepers. So um, this is this is totally only for you. Uh, but inside of the uh, inside of the accounting and bookkeeping uh, software that are out there, so like Zero and Wave Accounting and even QuickBooks, there are forums and there are marketplaces for you to, to add yourself into those places as providers of those software. So you have to, of course, be uh, aware of that, um, but you can actually join those networks and then you can, you can um, lightly use that space as a space to actually then uh, bring people out of those spaces to your other social media. So you can then say, oh, you know what? I'm an accountant uh, and I want to, or a bookkeeper, and I want to be on the Wave platform to be able to get people who are interested in getting some bookkeeping or accounting done within Wave, so paying you for services within Wave, um, but maybe they're not yet, yet ready to do so, you can then in your profile that talks about you, uh, direct people to your social space. So you can say, hey, by the way, I'm really active here on this social network, come visit me here and engage with me, and that helps them to get to know you better, and those touch points then can lead them back to Wave to then hire you or or back to your website to hire you, which is probably better than through Wave. And so that that's one way in which I can see this being useful is using using the already established marketplaces for accounting and bookkeeping to be able to drive people to social to then drive them to your website for conversion. Great. Thank you, Ray, for all this great information. And we'll see you all on our next webinar.